So welcome everyone. This is our final faculty corner of 2020. It's hard to believe that we're already here. Um, we're very happy that all of you have decided to join us on this chilly and sunny day. Today, we are having a discussion about what it is like to be a faculty both at the University of Michigan, an R1 public institution, and at a HBCU or Historically Black College or University. Uh, today, our guest speakers are Dr. Kevin Jones and Dr. Marina Saviera. Um, they are going to be driving this conversation. If you have questions, please feel free to unmute and ask or put them in the chat. Um, we want this to be a welcoming and learning environment. So with that, I will hand things over to Marina, who will be our guest moderator. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for joining to this meeting. And I'm very excited about it. So as Meg said, please feel free to unmute yourself or send questions on the chat as, as, as you prefer. Uh, so I'd like to start to ask Kel Kevin to introduce himself. And if you could please talk a little bit about your past training that has led you to your career as a professor and has led you to the University of Michigan. Okay, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's, it's nice to always get a chance to, to speak to, to postdocs, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, as you mentioned, prior to coming to the University of Michigan, I was a assistant professor in biology at Howard University. Um, my, my career path is quite different than a traditional career path. Um, I actually spent the majority of my career as, a, as an instructor. I, I spent most of my career um, teaching and then sort of... Um, started came back to doing uh, uh, research later in my career. So um, after I graduated with my PhD, I did a, a brief postdoc in Madrid, Spain uh, to do neuropharmacology in uh, the Ramon y Cajal Institute. And uh, that was a really uh, life-changing experience. It was my first uh, time living outside of the United States and it uh, had a number of uh, influences on my life, not the least of which I ended up meeting my, my spouse over there. Um, when I came back to the United States, um, I really, uh, because of some experiences that I had had, I, I really had always enjoyed teaching. And so I really had focused on um, establishing uh, myself as an instructor, learning how to teach, learn, you know, and I've, I've taught at um, institutions from a variety of levels, all the way from uh, private, uh, small liberal arts, wealthy liberal arts colleges to public community uh, colleges and everything in between, uh, private medical schools, public medical schools. And so um, after that, my wife had a, uh, had a change in her career trajectory and she had an opportunity to work with uh, uh, former President Barack Obama. And so um, at the time I was, uh, I was a faculty member at a, uh, at a um, medical school where I was an instructor, I was in a you know, position as an instructor. And this school had very little research. And what I had realized after being so away, so, uh, away from the bench for several years is my God, I missed it. I really missed it so much. And so um, at this school, I was actually, because they had very little research activity, I was actually volunteering um, with a, another, uh, at another nearby university driving an hour and a half uh, sometimes in traffic. We were living in Los Angeles at the time. And so uh, when my wife got this opportunity, uh, at the time, she wasn't sure if she was going to take it. But I said, you know, this is an incredible opportunity for you. I'm not terribly um, thrilled about being just a lecturer. I really want to bring research back into my, you know, into my career. And so um, at that point, I decided to do something which was really um, it was a gamble for me at this point in my career. I decided to leave a tenure track lecturing position, a tenure track position to go and do a second postdoc. And it was the best decision I, I ever made. And so I, I left uh, I, I left that university. My wife moved to Washington DC to work uh, with the Obama administration. And I uh, was able to arrange an opportunity to do a second postdoc in Washington DC. 
and it was phenomenal. Uh, one of the, not only was it great to be back in the lab and to be back to, to sharpen my research skills, learn some, some newer techniques, it was the first opportunity, it was the first time in my career where I also gained a mentor, right? I'd had a scientific PhD advisor, but I never had a, a, a mentor. And so I, I gained mentorship and then was able to sort of navigate through the rest of my career. And um, if there's one piece of advice is find you a good mentor or as many mentors as you think you need. You need a career mentor. You need not just a scientific mentor, but you know, a career mentor. And that's what I found during my second postdoc. And so uh, my PI, uh, when I was a postdoc, my PI uh, left very abruptly, left. Um, uh, and so I had about six months to sort of decide what I was going to do. Uh, during that time, there was a, um, a job announcement for a, oh, so my, my postdoc was in neurophysiology. This is where I learned to do patch clamp electrophysiology and slice electrophysiology and culture neurons. And it was a very, you know, it was, it was a physiology postdoc. So a job um, announcement had come out and one of my colleagues alerted it to me. Um, she said, hey, there's a job I think that you should take a look at. At the time, I wasn't necessarily interested um, in taking a faculty position. I had just, I had just uh, been awarded a postdoctoral fellowship, so I had funding for about the next four years. And I loved being at the bench. I loved being a postdoc. But my family had started to expand at that point. This was three years in the postdoc. We had kids. And the one thing that really stinks about a postdoc, or the only thing I think that really stinks about the postdoc, is the salary. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's so tight to try to support you a family on a postdoc salary. So um, uh, let me be more brief. I uh, saw this job announcement and it was, it looked like they had written it for me. They were looking for someone who was a neurophysiology background. They wanted someone to teach. They wanted someone to teach animal physiology, which I had taught. They wanted someone to teach pharmacology, which I had taught for many years. They wanted someone to um, start a basic sort of uh, physiology, uh, a lab-based neurophysiology course. And so without giving it too much thought, I applied. And it turns out the school was the, literally, it was across the street from where I was doing my postdoc, it was Howard University. And so on the day of my interview, I literally took off my lab coat, put on a tie, walked across the street to the interview. Wanted it because of the salary, um, but really fearful of missing the bench. And so long story short, I, I was offered the position and just fell in love with the institution. It was a really uh, working with the students, being a part of the history of that university. Um, not a lot of people are familiar with, with Howard University, but if you're, if you're well aware of historically black colleges and universities, Howard is usually the one that comes to mind really, you know, most prominently. Um, uh, uh, Kamala, uh, Kamala Harris is, a, is an alumni of uh, the, the president, vice president-elect. Kamala Harris is an alumni of Howard University. So it's a really prestigious kind of place. So I was happy to be there and happy to be a part of it. Um, and it's where I really refined my teaching skills. Um, I was in the undergraduate college. I was in the biology department. And so in the biology department, you usually have a either 3-3 three, three or a 4-3. Um, uh, oh, so you either have three classes in the fall, you have to teach three classes in the spring or sometimes a four class in the fall, three classes in the spring. So it's a teaching intensive place. And so that was the place where I really got to refine my teaching skills. And I was able to start a small, small laboratory. But um, what happened was that my, my research uh, really started to pick up and uh, that's how I ended up becoming a uh, faculty at uh, the University of Michigan. I came to a point in my career where I was looking at, um, I'm a pharmacologist by, uh, my formal training is in pharmacology. I moonlight as a neuroscientist, but I'm a pharmacologist. And so one of the things that I've, like the focus of my research is trying to uh, understand glutamatergic signaling in the brain, how it's disrupted. And there are several diseases that we're interested in. I'm very, very fascinated with disease of schizophrenia. And so, you know, the central focus of my lab is, can we understand how glutamate signaling is disrupted in schizophrenia? And can we identify new drugs to treat this disease? So that's something that always been, has always been my passion, but, and that's something that you absolutely can only do at a handful of universities in the country. Um, and the University of Michigan is one of them. Like our drug discovery 
uh, our legacy of doing drug discovery is, you know, among the best in the nation. And so when I had an opportunity to come here, um, we, we went for it. And so we uprooted the family and relocated here to, uh, to Ann Arbor. And uh, I've been here for about five years now. So I think that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's really nice. It's a really impressive career trajectory. Okay. Uh, so Kevin, we receive a lot of questions uh, specifically about HBCUs. But I think before we jump into the questions, it would be interesting if you could talk a little bit about what an HBCU is and what are the benefits and the strengths of HBCUs. Sure. So uh, historically black colleges and universities, you know, there was a time in this country. So, uh, you know, right after the Civil War, after, um, you know, African slaves were freed, uh, you know, the, the country had a, a, a responsibility to educate, to allow slaves to get education, right? I mean, they, we, you know, they had never been allowed to actually receive education and it was forbidden for, um, you know, uh, black Americans to go to uh, colleges and universities. So as a solution to that, um, they started to develop uh, universities where they would permit descendants of slaves to go to get education. And so from their uh, inception, it was the only opportunity for higher education uh, for slaves. And in fact, most of the uh, universities that are now universities today, they actually started off, uh, you know, being either um, uh, teachers colleges, because that was the primary thing, that was the primary problem they were trying to solve. Like, we need to make, we need to create teachers to be able to teach the sons and daughters of these freedmen and freedwomen. So that was the, you know, the primary impetus of developing a historically black college and universities. Over time, they've started to evolve, but that was the impetus. So, um, uh, and there were, at, at one point, there were, I think there was about 135 or 140 at one point. That, that number has dwindled, Some, many of them have closed, but I think, I believe there's still over about 100 um, historically black colleges and universities. So then the next thing they started to do was that then you started to see the professional schools emerge. So then you started to have, because, you know, uh, where could, where was the black community gonna get their doctors or their lawyers? They couldn't go to, you know, Cornell or, you know, or Yale. So um, then you started to see the medical schools emerge where they would train black doctors and dentists and, and lawyers and so forth. And then um, more recently, you, start to, you started to see them expand and, you know, well, I guess they've always had, you know, basic science departments because there's a long history of, you know, basic scientists that have come out of places like Howard. But that's, you know, in large part, that's some relatively newer uh, wrinkle of, of their story. In the very beginning, they were focused on creating teachers, doctors, lawyers, right? And in a lot of vocational schools. And so the interesting thing about them is that there are, like I said, over a hundred, I think maybe 110 or something, but they're very, very different. They have very, very different personalities and missions and goals. And so um, to try to describe what an HBC like, you have to be a bit more specific because there's very different experience between something, someplace like Spelman College, which is a small all women's HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia, versus uh, Florida A&M University, which is a huge land grant school in, in Florida. So, um, and then there's private and, and public as well, the difference between private and public, public schools as well. Um, nowadays, their principal focus is um, mostly it's for African-American families where they will send their kids to, to go to school, not exclusively. When I taught at Howard, I had one of my favorite students was actually a student from Vietnam. Um, again, it makes me clap, laugh just thinking about her. But so now their their student body is much more uh, global as everything else is in the country. But still, their core focus is you know educating uh, young black men and women, developing black men and women to go out and be leaders in you know every sort of field of human endeavor. That's kind of the the broad broad mission um, of the schools. And they achieve that to less, you know, to more or lesser degrees. It really, really depends on the institution. You can see just like any other 
um, school, right? Uh, different levels of success. Right, and following on this line of the different missions and goals, uh, what was the mission and goals of the institution that you worked at? And also, uh, what would be the cultural difference? So for example, mm -hmm. lab, lab cultural difference versus classroom cultural difference between the university, the HBCU in Howard and the University of Michigan. Do you have any Yeah, yeah, that's, that? that's, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. So, you know, Howard, Howard is, you know, one of the premier, if not the premier um, HBCU. So it has a very sort of a broad mission, which is like, um, I guess I would say it's, you know, to create the best and brightest among all, you know, all aspects of, you know, um, industry and, you know, in the United States. It's a very broad aspirational kind of goal. Um, they, you know, as a whole, for example, in, the, in scientists, most PhD, most African Americans that have a PhD got their undergraduate training at historically black colleges, universities. That's, that's still the case today. Um, um, so it, it's a large place where uh, a lot of black students go to get educated right out of, out of high school. It's, 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 it's still a common choice. Um, lots of differences. So some of the differences, like if I'm going to compare being a faculty at Howard to being a faculty at Michigan, there's a couple of things we have to take into consideration with that. So one, now I'm in the medical school at the University of Michigan. So I'm sure that there are probably um, some differences between being in a medical school versus being in a undergraduate college. That was one of the distinctions of my two positions. Um, and then this, and then on top of that, there's the differences between being at an HBCU and, and a predominantly white university. So one of the biggest differences probably um, about being in the classroom in the labs is that they were smaller, right? So when I taught at Howard, my typical class size was anywhere from 30 to 30, 35 was kind of on the high side. Most of my classes, I usually would have about 25 students to, yeah, usually around 30 is typical, right? And so that allows for um, faculty to engage with students on a different level than when you're teaching a class that has, you know, 300 students or 400 students. It was rare, that there were only the, only the, in the biology department, the only classes that had sections would be the introductory classes. Once you got to like <clears throat> junior level classes, there was typically just one section of a course. Maybe genetics was the, the other class. That, yeah, but that was a sophomore course. So, so that was the one thing, the smaller, more personal, very, um, uh, very sort of uh, uh, more intimate uh, teaching environment, right? Uh, and that's probably just a function of its size. I've taught at other places where they had very small student to teacher ratios as well, and that was a function of its size. Um, the students come mostly from America, but all across the country. And I'd say probably maybe at Howard, I guess probably 80, 85% are, are uh, of African descent, either African-American or they get a lot of international students from uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, probably about 80%, I would guess. Don't quote me on those numbers. You guys could find that out if you wanted to, but somewhere around that. Yeah. So you said that a lot of uh, undergrads, uh, uh, black, uh, black students undergrads get their degree at uh, HBCU. Yeah. And when they go to um, graduate programs, do you have any thoughts on what would be the important features of programs that successfully provide research opportunities for students coming from HBCUs. Yeah, that's a really that's, grad program. Yeah, that's a really good question. So if I understand the question correctly, I, I think you're asking about, so you have these uh, students that are coming from HBCUs and then they're transitioning to um, like majority uh, white schools. And, and yeah. right. So what are the features of the programs to provide opportunities for these students? Yeah, right. So that's an interesting question. I think that so, so you know, one of the primary differences is going to be in, in terms of tangible resources, material resources. So, you know, some of our bigger schools, especially the private institutions, 
um, you know, the Ivy League schools, for example, um, you know, lots of material resources, a lot of material wealth. So for example, it's rare that a that an undergraduate student at an HBCU is going to be able to do a research project using something like a two photon microscope can happen, but it's rare or something that's very expensive, right? Like a very expensive, uh, you know, piece of equipment. So the first um, benefit of that. So when I was when I was undergrad, I actually did summer programs and I went to uh, University of Illinois Ch Chicago was one of the programs that I went to. And so, you know, to get exposure to what it's like to do research at a uh, R1 institution that has this level of resources that are, you know, have a lot of material resources. So there's that sort of advantage to give students exposure to that. Um, but more important than that, I think it's about the networking opportunities, right? Because um, I think as you all realize, to be successful in our business, you know, as scientists, it's, it's really about the sort of connections that you can make and, and being able to be part of teams that are doing science and these sorts of things. And so really it's about giving people the opportunity to, uh, to, to benefit from the network that you have, right? That's probably more important than actually you know, spending time on a fancy new technology or something like that. Um, I think that the students that, um, I think that students that can come from these universities are often quite clever when it comes to, um, quite clever when it comes to figuring out how to do things and alternative methods, like, like at a cheaper scale, like how can we, hack something else to repurpose something? How can we, what, what's another way to do it than the most expensive way, right? And that's, you know, sort of a, it brings sort of a, frug, a sort of a frugal mindset to things like, huh, I, I see what we're trying to do, but there might be a cheaper way that we can do this. So um, that's one of the benefits. On the other side, I think that, for example, any postdocs or graduate students that might have an interest in uh, teaching, I think that at large schools, I think it's difficult to get meaningful teaching experiences. Um, I know when I was in grad school, I went to Duke. Um, at Duke, there, there weren't any opportunities to, and I knew I wanted to teach, there weren't any opportunities to really teach a course because my PI only taught, you know, five lectures a year or something like it just, that didn't exist. I think Michigan has started to come up with some solutions for that. You know, I, I know that one of my students is in the teaching certificate and you do get to TA a class and that, that sort of thing. And so, um, but, but my, my point being was that there are opportunities perhaps um, for students to find teaching opportunities at HBCUs to go there and teach courses. When I was a faculty there, I used to have guest lecturers come from George Washington, which is a, 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 school, a school nearby uh, Howard University. I would have, uh, PhD students or postdocs that I knew, I just say, hey, you want to come in and, you know, give a guest lecture on, uh, you know, we're teaching the eye of the auditory system, or whatever, and they would come in and give a guest lecture and help write some um, test questions because it, it, it gave them an opportunity to put some teaching on their CVs when they were getting ready to go, uh, you know, hunt for jobs and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, teaching opportunities can be very challenging sometimes for, especially when you are in the med school. Yeah. So, yeah. So we receive another question is to talk about the HBCU. Yeah. And does having an HBCU on your resume make the landing job market more challenge? If it's so, if yes, why or why not? I think, it, I think it depends. I think it depends. So in one situation where it could make it more challenging, like, you know, if you want to go to a very, um, if, if you're trying to get a position in a very technology heavy uh, uh, field, it can certainly it can certainly hinder you if you don't have um, expertise, you know, with with some equipment that you didn't have access to. So I, I guess the question is like a postdoc coming from an HBCU trying to get a faculty position. Is that the, the idea? Uh, it was not a specific comment what would be the idea, but okay. I so, so, so yeah, so in that situation, it could definitely, you know, that could definitely be a challenge. But if you're looking to go to a teaching university, um, 
it, it, it can definitely be a benefit because they, they know you've had a lot of experience um, teaching in the classroom, teaching in laboratories. You're, you've had experience working with diverse populations of students. So I kind of, I guess it kind of depends on what your, what the career objective might be. Yeah, that makes sense. So we actually cover all the questions that were related to HBCUs and your uh, professional experience working at HBCU and how they compare to our one institution. So if anyone from the crowd has some questions that you want to ask on the chat or please unmute yourself. Otherwise, I will move to the second batch of questions that we have that are more related to career development and job search. So if someone has any question, please just interrupt me and say your questions. But we receive a lot of questions of postdocs asking for advice for postdocs that are thinking about, transition to, uh, about transitioning to a faculty position especially nowadays with all the challenges and everything. Yeah. So would you have some advice for postdocs that are thinking about to transition to a faculty position now? Yeah, that's, that's, that's so many different things. And I, you know, with the pandemic, my goodness, I, I, I feel so, um, wow, I have so much empathy for anyone like who was planning to go on the job market right now because everything just ground to a halt. But, you know, the best thing, the first piece of advice I would get say is find a mentor. Like this, you, you're not, you can't just get a faculty position by responding to an ad and filling out the thing. I mean, there's a lot of nuances to it. So, you know, spend time thinking about what you want and be very, very honest with a mentor that can guide you, right? Find, find someone who's done that. Like this is not, you, you can't figure this out by yourself particularly this particular part of your career. So, you know, be very frank, like, you know, talk to your mentor. Okay, I want to be in a position where I don't want to teach. I do not want to teach. I only want to run a lab. Then that's the kind of conversation you and your mentor can have, and you can start to filter through which positions are going to be right for you. And is this even the time? I mean, these positions are, you know, um, is this even the time, you know, uh, I don't know what the average length of postdoc is right now, but a few years ago, it was typically around six years. People were doing, you know, either two, three-year postdocs or, you know, one five or six-year uh, uh, postdoc. So your, 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 your mentor can really give you an honest appraisal of whether or not, you know, this is the right time in your career for it. Um, I have more specific advice I'm going to give you, but that's the first thing I would say, because I don't have all the answers to that. Like I, I, my career trajectory was very, very convoluted. So, uh, but, but that's my broad advice is, you know, find someone you can confide in and be really honest with yourself and really honest with them. Do you really want that job that your, that your PI is encouraging you to take? Because, you know, they, it come, it comes with a lot. Um, some more specific things. One of the books that I love right now, um, and I use it all the time, it's usually on my bookshelf, is this one. You guys probably seen this by um, Kathy Barker at the helm. It's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's really good. It gives you um, hands-on practical advice. This one I keep right there. This one, this other one, I don't read so much, but I, I, it's at home in my home library. I, I don't read it as much, you know, Every January, I pull it out and figure out how I'm going to improve my lab. But this is a pretty good one, too, um, making the right moves. But I really like the, the Kathy Barker book because um, it gives practical advice. Like, how do you set up your lab on the first day? Um, how often should you meet with your students? How do you protect your time? Those kinds of things. I, I should have I followed more of it, but more and more I'm following, following more. After I've made all these mistakes, I'm going back and taking, it, taking advice. Um, the other thing I would say, probably the, the part that I didn't expect is um, learn your soft skills. Like if you're, if you're not, if you don't have really good people skills and you don't feel comfortable having um, frank conversations with people and like if that kind of stuff makes you uncomfortable, work on that because um, so much of this job is about that. And I didn't realize that. Like you, you think the job is about managing you know the science and the projects it kind of is but but to be honest i'm at the bench um not as much as i would like to be 
and and that's okay but most of my time is spent mentoring my graduate students and so there was a question that you that one of the students asked and it was about mentoring the graduate students i think that's the most critical part of the job because they're your they're your boots on the ground they're your, they're your hands at the bench you know you have these ideas but you're not executing them, right? Your graduate students are executing them, or if you're fortunate, either your postdocs are executing them. And so you have to find out what makes them tick on a personal level. And um, that's, that, that takes time. I think the thing, one of the mistakes I made in the beginning was not building, not taking the time to build trust with the graduate students, right? Um, you have to let them know that it, that failure is okay. Like it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. Like whenever I bumble something in the lab, I let everybody know, oh man, you know what I did? I left out the primary, no wonder it didn't work. Like that just, that just relaxes the environment and then it lets them feel like they can admit their shortcomings to you because they're there. They have their insecurities. We all have um, things that we're bad at. And so I'm in the beginning, I didn't do that. In the beginning, I tried to be very task oriented and say, okay, you need to do this by this date and this by that date. And I want it here and it's five o'clock. And I told you on the 31st, you know, that doesn't work. That hasn't worked for me. Maybe it's just um, the group that I work with or, or something, but that hasn't worked for me. Instead, what works is trying to figure out how to, um, how to inspire or how to motivate them. How like to how to light that natural fire, you know, inside of them. And then I had to realize not everybody's like me. I'm a lab. I'm a um, I'm a lab geek. I, I, there are a few places in the world that I prefer to be than in the lab. I mean, maybe at the beach or something. But I, I if I don't have something to do, uh, when I was a postdoc, if I didn't have something to do, I would be at the lab. Like I just. The lab is the most interesting place for me because I'm, I'm a really lab geek. But part of that I realized, so when I came, when I opened up my lab, I thought that everyone would think like that, but they don't and that's okay. And like, I had to learn to accept that. Um, and then this, it's, there's a difference between how times are different now and then. Like you can get so much work done outside of the lab nowadays that you couldn't get done outside of the lab 10 years ago. So, you know, I, I had to relax that expectation. I apologize if I'm rambling, um, but but I, what, I, what I want you to realize, if I can say one thing and let me sum it up, is that <clears throat> I think being successful is really about the soft skills. Like you have to learn to relate to people. And that's something that I, I wasn't really good at. And um, I'm getting better. I'm trying like to learn how to treat all the different people as individuals. You can't mentor everybody the same. I only had one speed and I, I've had to learn to adapt for that. Yeah, that's that's a really good advice. I kind of feel relief when my my boss he says he he starts to tell the mistake he did as a postdoc. So it's a good feeling to think, oh okay, it's okay to make a mistake. So yeah. I think that it's definitely a good strategy. <laughs> so still thinking about like this job search, uh, what are the steps that postdocs or grad students should take to succeed in their job search? Or what are the qualities that are expected for a postdoc that is going to the job search? Do you have any comment on that? I, I, yeah, I do. I, 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 made a, I made a note about that. Um, uh, I don't think it's any, I, I don't have a magic um, piece of advice, but I mean, you know, it's, it's hard out there. So publish, you know, your PI, I'm sure tells you that, like that's, the name of the game for the most part is but i'm assuming you're talking about getting a position at a r1 school where you're going to be research focused is that what you mean um so the questions were not really specific but okay. i'm assuming it would be like r1 school yeah i so, think if you want to go to more teaching you would have to go towards getting teaching experience right so let's assume they're thinking about i Right. So in that case, I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot of, I mean, I think it's the same thing that any PI would say. So, you know, publish as much as you can. Um, um, you can consider, you can consider alternate paths to um, an R1 institution. Before the call started, we were talking about research, um, 
a research assistant or a research professor track. That's a really interesting track um, for some for some people, right? So I think you guys know about these positions. They're becoming more common. They weren't very common when I was coming through. Um, but you know, these are positions where you get to have a bit of autonomy. Um, sometimes you want the budget. Sometimes you know when you're working under a PI, but you get to manage your own science. That's a brilliant uh, step if you don't think that you're uh, you know, if, if, if the job search doesn't pan out the first time. Um, networking is really important. So many, so many, um, so many jobs I've heard about, it's just so many people getting jobs that I've heard about is really through word of mouth. Um, when you're ready to go on the job market, tell your PI to tell everybody she knows, get on Twitter. I mean, just tell everybody and, and have them and, and ask them to promote you. Like it's so much better when the PI says, oh my God, I have this amazing postdoc, she's brilliant. And she's just about to go on the, the, the job market, right? I mean, that catches people's attention as opposed to, um, you know, some job searches, you get 400 applications and, you know, how do you, how do you stand out? Um, um, hopefully your PI, if, if you're fortunate enough to have, work with a PI that has connections, they can sometimes pick up the phone call, uh, pick up the phone and say, hey, I see you guys have a job ad, you're looking for someone who does, um, you know, looking at cardiac, uh, you know, uh, you know, dysfunction. I have a great postdoc. He doesn't exactly do that, but here's what he does do. And he's really good. Is there any flexibility in this? Like how constrained are these because I, I when I was at Howard for example I haven't been on I have not been on a job search committee here but I've been on a, a job search committee at Western University in both Howard and um, I, I can tell you that when a good person comes along that doesn't fit the job description if, if she's good they will throw her name into the um, get an interview bunch anyway because she's really excellent and it, and it became clear and the only reason that person applied is because the, the you know, one of their mentors might have called and said, how flexible are you guys in that position? So I, I don't like the idea. Some people give the advice of apply to everything. That's transparent. I, I think most committees can see through that. But what does work is if you find out if you can have someone or you call yourself, you call up and say, hey, I don't exactly fit that, but here's, I'm great, I'm really good. It'd be better if you have someone else say, it, but if you, if not, toot your own horn. So I'm really good. I don't exactly fit that description, but here's what I can bring. And I think I might be able to, to, to fill that. So in other words, don't apply for everything, but the ones that you think you might really want, give them a heads up that your application is gonna be different, but that it's coming, if that makes sense. You can call them before you send your application. I don't think it's such a good idea to call them after you've sent the application, but before you sent the application, you can. That's really good advice. And one thing that like, at least I think as a postdoc, I'm sure a lot of other postdocs will feel the same. Let's say when we get a faculty position, you're going to sleep as a postdoc and wake up on the next day as a faculty. And it's kind of a big change. So could you comment, how was that for you? Like wake up as a faculty in the next day and what were the challenges that were facing as a new faculty? Yeah, so um, it depends what your what your skill set is. So one of the things that I know that I'm bad at is I'm bad at um, starting from a blank page in anything. Like I'm just you know when I walk it. So first day they give you the keys, you open up the door, and they're like, okay, what do you want to do? You want to knock out a wall? You want to add shelves? I'm like, I don't know. So um, what you can do is once you find out you you're getting a faculty position, network your butt off call everyone in the department, start reaching out to people and asking them how, you know, how to navigate the system. Michigan has a really difficult internal system. Like it's, it's very different than the one I came from. So just the way that the administration is set up, like the way that you interact with, like how do you order things? The way that we order things was very different than other places I've been. And so getting a buddy, <laughs> like hit the ground running, get a buddy, get someone on the faculty who can help you. Like for example, um, you know, you have to submit your annual protocols. As soon as you accept that job position, say, hey, I'm working with rats. Who has a rat protocol that I can use as a template? Because you don't want to start the no-go, right? Um, 
at Michigan, we have a lot of different, um, you know, safety uh, precaution. You have to, so there's your, I, you know, there's your, your, your IBC protocol and your, you know, your chemical protocol. So all of these things take up a lot of administrative time. So you can get uh, templates from someone who's already been there and done that and already submitted it and gotten, gotten that protocol approved and you can use it as a template. That will save you a lot of time. Um, uh, what else, what are the sorts of advice? Oh, the, one of the best things that happened for me was that I was able to bring a graduate student with me uh, from Howard and that was phenomenal. She's awesome. And so, you know, um, we walk in the door and she's very well organized. Like one of her strengths is just, she's an amazing organized person. So it was awesome having her. I'm like, okay, you know, here we go. It's all white walls and empty shelves. Let's go. And we started ordering things and building things. And then once another graduate student joined, they also pitched in. And so I think they, I think it was good for them to see that uh, from their perspective, like joining a lab that's, you know, basically just gotten the keys to the building and building from scratch. I think that was an interesting um, experience for them. Um, get help, get help, ask for help. Hopefully you have um, a really supportive kind of uh, chair or, or, or sometimes they have like a faculty li liaison at different schools. But anyway, whoever it is that works with junior faculty, don't be afraid to ask for help just because you got the job, they're not expecting you to know everything. They're not expecting you to come through the door and 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 start going after your 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 Nobel Prize. I mean, if you can do so, but if not, that that's okay. Um, it's okay to say I'm not sure. I don't understand this. How does it work? Um, because I think at a place like Michigan, a really big place like Michigan, the culture is very you know it's, it's very different than the sort of. Uh, than some places. You guys are going to be fine because you're at Michigan. So there's no place bigger than Michigan. So you're not going to have, there's no place that has more levels of administration and, and bureaucracy than Michigan. I don't think, I can't imagine. So you guys are going to be fine. If you learn to navigate Michigan's administrative levels and different, you know, silos, you'll be fine to go, go any place else, but definitely ask somebody when you get there for help. Um, I don't, that probably wasn't very useful, but, um, uh, Ask me another question, maybe a more cited, directed question. I can maybe give you a more directed. No, that, it was definitely very useful. And at the end, it seems like it's always good to have a mentor, right? doesn't matter which phase you are at your life, if you're a grad student, a postdoc, or a new faculty, it's always good to have someone with more experience to help you, right? Dr. Subramanian just posted a really interesting uh, thing in the chat. Yes, there yeah. are. There are two public Slack groups. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, you, we're, we're fortunate because of all these kind of technological things we have and now everybody's used to Zoom. Um, you're gonna feel isolated as an EPI. You're, you're gonna feel lonely. It's, it's, it's lonely in the beginning, it really is. Um, <clears throat> so I think these are great to you know stay in touch with people and meet new people. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's definitely a little bit lonely in the beginning. Yeah, other question that we received was about uh, uh, how you balance work and home responsibility while you're still making research. So you comment you have two kids, right? And how do you balance work and research and everything? Um, I'm not the best person at balancing work and, and, and research. I'm in the lab six days a week. Try not to be seven, but I'm in the lab all the time. So um, in the beginning, what I realized this, gosh, I was probably, but in the beginning when my kids were little and I was a postdoc, I was able to be absent. I was able to just be in the lab and grind things out because they weren't aware. Like little kids, they sleep all the time. Like they didn't realize daddy's gone. As they got older and they started to, you know, they started to want to spend more time then the real struggle became because you know you got this gel you're wearing or whatever you want to spend time with your kid nowadays what i've done what i've done is i um schedule in things that make sure i spend time with them for example my kids play football so i volunteer i'm a volunteer coach for his team not i, I like football but not so much that i'm passionate about football but then i know i am going to be there and spending time with him at least three, you know, at least three times a week for an hour and a half. I'm, I'm guaranteed to be there. So because the problem, the thing that I found is that this job, especially as a new professor, it will consume 
every waking moment, unless you, you know, like I said, unless I have something to do, I'm usually in the lab. So what I do is I schedule things so that I, to make sure that I spend enough time with my sons. I don't know if that's maybe sad, but, but, you know, but when I'm with them, I'm hundred percent engaged, have all my attention. And so my kids have kind of learned that, you know, dad is not going to sit on the couch and watch cartoons with me. He's not going to sit on, you know, like we don't spend random time together. When we spend time together, it's because we decided we're going to do a thing and we're all in and we have a good time and it's fun. And then I have dinner with them and then I go back to the lab or I go to my office and I get back to work. So for me, that works. Um, my spouse, my wife is incredibly, um, incredibly generous, uh, incredibly generous. Um, you know, she knows the demands of this and she's, we've been together a very long time. And so she understands and I'm like, I got a grant deadline. I'm not coming home tonight. Like I'm, I'm going to be here till one o'clock. So, you know, she gets that. But then on the other side, you know, we went on a, we went on a 10 day vacation a couple of years ago. Like I was just completely gone. So there's that flexibility in it. When for me, scheduling works, that's my solution. It's just, you know, I tell them I can do anything, but I can't, I can do anything with enough lead time, but I can't do anything spontaneous. Sponta spontaneity is the antithesis for me. My kid broke his foot a couple months ago and I, you know, I had to stop everything and run to the hospital and he turned out to be okay. And I was there and did all that stuff. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's four things left on my to-do list that I got to get done that I can't do, you know, because I got to deal with this emergency. Oh, the other thing. So all the little soccer games you have to go through as a, as a parent and the recitals and stuff, your kids are... My kid, for my kids, they want me to be there, but they don't know whether or not I'm really watching them kick the ball the wrong direction, you know, or or make a horrible saxophone recital. So bring something to read with you. Go to the recital, go there, be a good mom, be a good dad, show up. But during halftime, I go to the car and I'm deleting emails or, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I'm not good. With, I'm not, I haven't managed this good work-life balance and I don't have them fully segregated. And then with COVID time, it's even worse. Things are fully integrated. So COVID has really made things worse. But for me, I think what you have to do is pick the things that are important to you and just realize you can't do everything in this job. If you're going to, if you're going to run a lab, you're not going to be able to make every single basketball practice and all the game. you know, just I can anyway, you guys might be able to, but I haven't been able to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's difficult for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, there's a bit of a sacrifice to being a, a, running a lab for sure. There's a bit of a sacrifice involved. Um, yeah. But it's worth it. For sure. Um, so we have one last question and Please, ever, if everyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and say on the chat. But uh, I the last question is like, did you always knew that you want to become an academic professor? And what was the deciding factor for you? I think you comment a little bit that you were a instructor before, but yeah, did, did yeah. you always knew you wanted to stay in academia? Yeah, I always, I, I, I always wanted to teach for one time. I, I love teaching. But the other thing that I've always enjoyed is I just enjoy trying to solve puzzles right that's 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 really it at the end of the day for me um, i just really enjoy trying to solve puzzles like there's something there and i, I enjoy trying to figure out how it works um, um fortunately it's not necessarily just the success of solving the puzzle that i get that that i enjoy i enjoy the process i enjoy you know uh, the fail. I don't enjoy failed experiment. Well, you know, it, it's just part of it. Like you get used to it, right? Like you get used to the fact that 90, 85, 90% of your experiments are going to fail. But I actually enjoy that iterative process of trying something and then going back, trying something again. So I, I think that's really um, enjoying that is really good for a, a, a researcher, but that's not the only thing you can do if you enjoy that. I think I just discovered science before I discovered something like engineering, because I, I, I could see myself being an engineer as well, but I just discovered basic research science before I knew anything about engineering. It, 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 it checks a lot of the boxes for um, what gives me satisfaction professionally.
and basically it's chasing the solution for a puzzle. I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, does anyone have another question or want to make some comment? Uh, or I, I, I just questions? found my notes about um, uh, about being one more thing that I wanted to say about. Um, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, I realized one of the things that I did very early once I first got my, so when you go from being a postdoc to a PI, it's the biggest uh, salary increase you're ever going to have in your, in your life. It never gets, I mean, your salary almost doubles, right? Almost. So first thing I did was um, all those things that take up time that you don't enjoy do, doing them, pay someone else to do them. Right. So for the first couple of years when I lived in Washington, D.C., I didn't do my own. I hate doing laundry. I didn't do my laundry. I dropped it off at the laundromat, wash and fold. It costs money, but I have more money than time. So do that. Cutting the grass, washing my car, any of those kind of cleaning your house. Right. If you order food like, you know, you're only going to have a few a limited number of hours. And so one of the things one of the piece of advice I got was um, what's the word she used? One of my mentors told me. Uh, what is it called when you hire, farm out? She said, farm out all the stuff that you don't enjoy doing and just pay, pay money, farm it out. Have someone cook your food if you don't enjoy that, have someone fold your clothes, right? Just do all that because you have more time than money uh, ever in your life and, and you'll never, get, yeah. So that, that is one thing that was helpful. Yeah, <laughs> that's already good. Well, I, uh, does anyone have any other questions for Kevin or any comments? Um, hi, Dr. Jones. This is Emily Yaros. Hi. I'm a I'm actually a graduate student, um, not a postdoc, so I'm kind of looking at going to postdocs right now. Um, and I thought it was really interesting in the beginning of your talk when you uh, said that you went abroad for a postdoc. Do you recommend doing that? Okay. So and what did you do to? Uh, sorry, the second part. What did you do to kind of network for that? Mm, that's the key. That's the thing. That's the challenge with doing a postdoc abroad, right? You're going to come back to America. You're going to come back to the American system. And Americans are going to be reviewing your grants. And if you haven't networked with people. So the challenge is, I think it's easier to overcome that challenge now because you know yourself, it's the networking part. So plan your return before you leave. I would say... If, if you were gonna do that, I would say, identify who you're gonna work with uh, abroad and identify who you're gonna work with when you return and connect those two people and sort of pitch them on the idea that I'm going to build a collaboration between your two labs and I'm gonna be the conduit, for I'm gonna be the bridge. So I'm gonna go over here and start something and then I'm gonna bring it back to America to keep this thing going. I think that would make your return, um, I think that would make it more seamless. And I think that would probably be the way to really make sure you don't um, uh, delay your career progression, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you so much for the advice and for this whole talk. It, everything you said was very helpful. So oh, thank you for I taking the time to do this. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it was helpful. Well, yeah, I think if we don't have my questions, more questions, thank you very much. That was really great, Kevin. No, oh, the was pleasure was good. all mine. The pleasure was all mine. You guys are inspiring. You guys are doing so many interesting, cool things. It's, 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 it invigorates me to spend time with uh, postdocs. So thank you. Thank you. That's great. And thank you, and everyone, thank you for, for inviting me, Shoba. Thank you for the invitation, Shoba. Of course, yeah, it was long overdue, and I'm so glad that the calendars worked out and we could yeah. actually do it. Um, and I almost want to do like a part two because you had so many nuggets of wisdom that we can expand on around like time management and, you know, different mentoring styles um, and, you know, so many other good stuff. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. Course, yeah. Best of luck to all of you. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Everybody join me in thanking Dr. Jones and Dr. Silviero. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marina. You. I appreciate it. No, thank, thank you, Kevin. It was very nice to meet you. And if you have a moment, I put a link to a feedback survey. It's anonymous. It helps us improve. Um, please take a minute to, to fill out our survey.
And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Shoba. I see you. Thanks, Marina. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. See you Wednesday. Yeah, see you Wednesday. Bye. Bye.